Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are today watching this video. I'm Rob Redden. I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ, and I have been presenting lessons through YouTube and our web page for over two years now. Each week, bringing you a lesson from God's Holy Word. You know, in less than a week, this coming Friday, Christendom will remember that being Good Friday, which is a remembrance of the crucifixion of Jesus. We've been talking about things about the afterlife for several weeks. Now we want to shift and talk about the death of Christ. It is truly the most important event in the history of man. That event is the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. That event made the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation. Or humanity. We're going to just look at a couple, three basic messages that we can see from the cross. See about the cross. Threefold message of the cross. You know, the subject of grace, the grace of God, naturally leads us into the subject of the cross. And so I hope to uh, bring some clarity about the event of the crucifixion and perhaps also clear up some common misunderstandings about the crucifixion in this lesson. One of the foremost messages of the cross is God's love. It's a clear message of the cross. You know, I was talking to a Buddhist and she listened to a lesson on the crucifixion of Jesus. And she felt that our God was immoral of sending his son to die for others. And I'm sure there are others who twist the story of Jesus' death into an immoral thing. And the fact of the matter is, God would be immoral to, say, to lay such a burden upon an innocent victim that belongs on another if he were not willing. If the son was an unwilling victim, we could understand that. But Jesus was not an unwilling victim. He said he had power to lay down his life and power to take it up. In Hebrews 10, for example, verses 5 through 7. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here am I. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Several things are suggested here. There's the plan of the Father to redeem fallen man through the sacrifice of his Son. And there is the willingness of the Son who accepted the plan fully to become man and offer himself as a sin offering for humanity. 
What the cross did was manifest God to the world. What kind of God is he? Not an immoral God, but a God that is so concerned about humanity's destiny and loved humankind so much and his son and the Holy Spirit agreeing with this divine plan with the equal amount of love in the Godhead determined that this was the only way to do it. And so what the cross did was manifest God to the world. For example, in John 1 and verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side right now, the Son of God, who ascended back to heaven when he completed his task, has made him known. And the Father is known through the Son without God manifesting himself through the manifestation of his Son incarnate, we wouldn't have a great concept of God. We have the love of God. We have the love of Christ in 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So we can see here that the altruism of the Godhead means sacrifice for us. And the amazing thing is that the love of Christ is so manifested in the fact that he knew that many would not accept him. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, this is how God showed his love. Among us he sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sin. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, the cross defines what true love is. We hear so much about love. And basically, it means anything. And when something means anything, it barely means anything at all. And so I want to clear up something about agape love. We hear so much about the word agape, and that this is the word God chose to declare into the world unconditional love. Well, that's not truly, that's not true completely. Man's use of agape in Jesus' time was about as common as our word love or the Hebrew word ahava. And so it is used in context about almost anything in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The word in and of itself did not mean to the first century users of the word unconditional love. The context can and does give it that meaning. Let me show you how it is. And all of these verses either uses the noun agape or the verb agapao in these verses. Matthew 6 and verse 22, 24. You can't serve two masters, either You'll love one and hate the other. Now, we don't think serving the master, that love is unconditional love. Can be, but not necessarily. In Matthew 24, 12, Jesus talks about a time when love, agape, will grow cold. If it's unconditional love, how could it grow cold? In Luke 6 and verse 32, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And then he says, even sinners love those who love him. Love them. Well, that's conditional love. It's not unconditional love, but the word is agape. This is clear in Luke 11 and verse 43. Pharisees love the chief seats in the synagogues. Why? 
for selfish reasons. The word is agape, or agapao here. John 3.19, men love darkness rather than the light. Agapao, love, is that unconditional? Of course not. John 12.43, men loved darkness rather than light. Agapao. In John 12 and verse 43, men loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Men, agapao, the Greek word for to love, that we so often say is unconditional love. And then in John 15, 13, it says, greater love, agape, has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Well, if there's a, a greater agape, there's a lesser agape. But if it basically means unconditional love, how could it be any better than that? Or how could it be lesser than that? Marcus Dodd says concerning this verse, self-sacrifice is the high water mark of love. You see, God the Father, the Lord Jesus, and the writings of the New Testament christened the word agape as the word for unconditional love. But during the time of Jesus, it was no different than our word for love. One more thought. If the word in Paul's time meant unconditional love, why would he have to describe it in detail in 1 Corinthians 13? He gave it a divine meaning. And that is what the Lord's cross tells us about God. That nothing can declare the love of God free from all the adulterations of man than the cross. And I think about that beautiful hymn, The Love of God, and... One of the verses read, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and every one ascribed by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the, sc uh, the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That is truly what the cross manifests to you and me. And yes, when today we use the word agape, we mean the love that God showed to us and Christ demonstrated in his walk. And that became the essence of love. And now we have christened the word agape and agapao, the verb, to mean that unconditional love that we see manifested at the cross. You know, some see the cross of Jesus as only an altruistic act, a moral example. Of course, it includes that, but much, much more. So often people just reduces it uh, to one aspect, the full meaning of the cross, and that is not that is not good because we have to see it as a whole and rather than just categorize it at its least common denominator. Altruistic act, yes. Sacrificial love, yes. A moral example, lay down your life for your friends because I've done it for you. But it is a distinct and unique service rendered here and on so vast a scale that it the cross adequately expresses the deep message from God's heart. Love and grace embraced together at the cross. God's love moved him to act, and grace moved him to accept us in our unworthiness. That's the love of God demonstrated at the cross. The message of the cross is a clear message about the need for God's love because it's a message about sin. Let's get a perspective here. 
Would a loving God give his own son for us if we didn't need his sacrifice? What kind of God would take such action with such painful consequences, which was manifested in God bringing night in the middle of the day from noon to three, Matthew twenty-seven forty-five. The action God took reveals the heinousness of the nature of sin to God. And Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. And let me tell you, no translation can graphically describe what that word filthy means. It is just it's about as filthy as it gets. In Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to behold evil. You cannot look upon wrongdoing. God is so holy that he cannot even look at the evil that is done by man. In the Old Testament, we have Isaiah 53 and verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Romans 3.25 in the New Testament, God presented him as a sacrifice an atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, here we need to add as an aside the words to be sin are often misunderstood. To be is not in the Greek, is added to try to make sense of the expression. The word sin is often used in the sense of sin offering. Paul, knowing Hebrew, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, Philippians 3, recognized that the Hebrew word for sin, kata, is used about a hundred times for sin and about a hundred and twenty times for a sin offering. And the translation, the Greek translation of those occurrences of kata for sin offering is the Greek word here, pardon me, yes, the Greek word here, hamartia, for a sin offering. The New Living Translation captures this very well. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we may be made right with God through Christ. This is a judicial act of God, declaring that Jesus to be sin, that we might be declared to be made right and holy. We're not, but we're treated right or righteous because he treated his son as sin. It's very important to understand that when God told Aaron to take a lamb and, and make it a scapegoat and that he would put his hands upon that goat and the sins of the people would be transferred to that goat and he would be sent into the wilderness, we understand the symbolism of that. Now, that goat isn't running around with sin. You can't actually put sin into something that is less than human. You can't even transfer sin to, from one person to another, but you can treat that person or that animal as if he were a sin bearer, but you can't actually transfer the sin. You can transfer the responsibility and treat it as an offering for man's sin. 
You know, a dream can reveal a lot of things about a person. What you dream about can say a lot about you. And a man had a dream. And he visualized Jesus being beaten by those soldiers and the whip just tearing the flesh from Jesus back. And he said, no, no, stop. And he ran and he pulled the soldier back. And the soldier looked at the man and he saw his own face. We may not have nailed the nails through Jesus' wrist and feet. We may not have been there to beat Jesus and put the thorn upon his scalp. We may not have been there and pierced his side with that sword, but in essence, we did it. Our sins put him on that cross. There is no uglier picture of humanity than what happened to Jesus when he was put on that cross. And Paul epitomized that in his description of humanity in Romans chapter 1. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, a theologian, wrote, No man can be ignorant of the true nature of his own sinful heart who has honestly face the meaning of the sin of rejecting Christ as exacted in the crucifixion. That speaks to me very loudly, and I hope to you too. Thirdly, the cross of Christ is a message from God which declares his own righteousness. We've touched on this a little bit already, but we want to look at it in greater detail. This is an area of little concern for most people. Many believe in certain facts about the cross, but few do not estimate what problems were involved in bringing about a possible reconciliation between a holy God and the despicable sinner, which from God's point of view includes every one of us. You know, God has spoken. And the fact that Christ was sent to die for our sins is proof that love is countered with justice. And God cannot deny either aspect of his being. A judge may be a very loving judge, but he has to uphold the law. He has to be judge. He has to be just, and he has to be fair. What does this have to do with the death of Jesus? Would God had, have sent Christ unless it was an absolute necessity? Was the death of his son one of many options? And as a loving father, wouldn't he choose an alternate way of accomplish, accomplishing our salvation? If he could, what does the scripture say? I'm reading from the New International Version, Romans 3, 25 and 26. God presented him, Christ, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, that is, before the cross of Christ, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. 
so as to be just. He demonstrated his justice in not bringing about the full retribution for sin in the past. The word demonstrates means proof. We see it used in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 24. Therefore, show to these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches may see it. That proof is a demonstration of his justice. This verse states that we believe to be the deepest divine problem. How can God deal righteously with the sinner and at the same time satisfy his own compassion and love in saving the sinner from the doom that he deserves, that he must ultimately impose because of sin? As the righteous judge, he must pronounce the full divine sentence against sin. And yet, his mercy is extended in that the penalty was paid by the death of Christ on the cross. A.T. Robertson writes, Nowhere has Paul put the problem of God more acutely and profoundly to pr pronounce the unrighteous, righteous, is an unjust in itself. God's mercy would not allow him to leave man to this fate. God's justice demanded some punishment for sin. The only possible way to save some was the propitiatory, the appeasing offering of Christ and the call for faith on man's part. Yes, the cross of Christ demonstrates the righteousness of God in forgiving you of your sin and forgiving my sin as well. You know, in conclusion, 1 Corinthians 1, 23, Paul says, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Today, many look upon the cross as just a manifestation of God's love and that he can't really send anyone to hell unless they're a serial killer or a psychopath or a sociopath. That the death of Jesus is just a moral example. But serious believers believe that the dilemma that God faced show the true picture of the seriousness of sin and the high price God had to pay for its remedy. In Hebrews 2.9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus died on that cross on what is called Good Friday. It was good in its results, like a surgery to cure a person of a fatal, fatal tumor is good. It can be good for us if we embrace the cross. Paul said in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul embraced the cross. He embraced the crucifixion and he realized he had to be crucified with Christ that he might also live with him. What is your relationship with the Lord? Have you embraced the cross for you and for your salvation? If you have, then you, like Paul, you're allowing Christ to live in you. You're making those choices as Christ would make those choices. You would sacrifice your will to his will, and you would live by faith who loved you 
and gave himself up for you as he has for me as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we wish Christ did not have to endure that horrible suffering and death. But we are also grateful that he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. That he took upon himself the sins of humanity and he became that sacrifice for our sins. Help us, dear God, to embrace the benefits of that death so that we will spend eternity with you in heaven. Thank you, dear Lord, for your un indescribable love, your matchless love, that no painter, no author could ever fully describe your indescribable, incomparable love in giving us your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for listening today. And I encourage you to meet with your fellow Christians here on the Lord's Day and render homage, worship, and glory to your Lord. Until we meet again through this avenue, God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Goodbye.